Alrighty, hi, howdy, welcome to class. This is Psych 320, Neuroscience Chapter 5. We're going to be talking about drugs, addiction, and reward, but before we get started, I want to make clear that I am not a professional, okay? This right here, what you're watching, is just my stand-up comedy routine. Now, with that out of the way, let's get on with it. Talking about psychopharmacology. Alright, psychopharmacology is the scientific study of psychoactive drugs and its application. Psychopharmacology is a key area of training for mental health professionals. If you deal with clients who are on medication or clients who have drug addiction, you have to have a background in psychopharmacology. When we talk about things that are psychoactive, we are talking about things that alter psychological processes. So we're talking about psychoactive substances that alter behavior. The main effect, or the main reason for taking the drug, is to change physiological processes be it for better or for worse. Drugs, then, are exogenous. They exist outside of the body. We're talking about exogenous chemicals that alter physiology. By altering physiology, we alter the nervous system, and thus we alter behavior. Now, we have plenty of endogenous chemicals that do the same thing, all right? We're talking about chemicals inside the body. But drugs are exogenous chemicals. Drugs exist outside of the body. The drug class that we are looking at are opioids. Opioids fit within the drug of abuse category and the pharmacotherapeutic category. Now, these two classes are the ones that you will deal with professionally. Again, that's drugs of abuse category and pharmacotherapeutic category. Now, we do have opioids in our body, right? These are endogenous opioids. Endogenous opioids generated within the body include the runner's high, wherein athletes will reach a state that lessens pain and inhibits memory so that they run better. Opioid analgesics is the formal name for the class of opioids that we are studying. Here, when it comes to the background, let's talk about classes of drugs. We use the background, or framework, as a shortcut to help us classify the hundreds of individual drugs in the world. A single drug is called a prototype, and we typically use framework to help us understand one or two prototypes, which then helps us learn more about other drugs that fit that background. To this point, we learn about classes of drugs, not individual drugs. This is how we start mastering this area. Again, we don't learn about individual drugs, we learn about classes of drugs. And a single drug is called a prototype. All right, getting into kinetics and dynamics. Pharmacokinetics, movement of drugs. Pharmacokinetics studies the movement of a particular class of drugs from the external environment, through the body, to the site of action, and then finally out of the body. And then pharmacodynamics, on the flip side, is the action of the drug on the body. Pharmacodynamics deals with how the drugs alter our physiological processes. So the way to remember this is pharmacokinetics, right? Kinetic movement, movement of drugs, but then pharmacodynamics, dynamic action, Pharmacodynamics is the action of the drug on the body. Talking about tolerance and dependence, tolerance is a reduced reaction to a drug as a result of prior experience. Exposure to the drug changes how the body reacts to it. Now, there are different types of tolerance. One type is that prior experience to a drug changes how the body responds to that drug. For example, a person can drink more than they could at first because their body has built up a tolerance to alcohol. And to this point, tolerance is the opposite of sensitization. Tolerance is basically getting used to something. And then when it comes to dependence, the idea here is that we got a habit to function normally. Dependence is the expression of the change that occurs when a person becomes tolerant to something. Dependence is the expression of the change that occurs when a person becomes tolerant to something. When the drug is taken away, your nervous system is different than it was before due to dependence. So, to function normally after growing such a strong tolerance to a certain drug, your nervous system depends on that drug. You need it to function normally. When it comes to withdrawal and craving, in the past we talked about psychological and physiological dependence. But psychological dependence does not make much sense in this context, because there is only one physical reality. So, nowadays, instead, we talk about dependence in terms of withdrawal, and craving. Again, withdrawal and craving are the two expressions of dependence. Opioid withdrawal is relatively mild. The person will experience flu-like symptoms, 
whereas craving is viewed as the other form of dependence. Craving when it comes to opioids is very serious. Craving used to be the psychological reaction to the sights, sounds, and smells associated with the drug that triggers the dependence on that drug. Craving has a physical grounding. Again, the withdrawal from opioids is like a serious case of the cold. Physical dependence will peak in a few days and then subside. The important thing here is that we throw away psychological dependence. Okay, replace that term with craving because we have a good understanding of how craving works. We will talk about this with opioids. We see evidence for both tolerance and craving with opioids. There is not an incredibly strong withdrawal from opioids, but again, the craving with opioids is crazy. All right, defining side effects and toxicity. Side effects are the additional effects of the drug that are not the reason for giving the drug. There are main effects and there are side effects. The main effects are the reason for taking the drug. So when it comes to main effects, ask yourself, what is the reason for using the drug? But on the flip side, side effects are the effects that are unwanted. All right, so with this, these side effects, you would ask the question, what are the unwanted effects of using the drug? What is main and what is side will vary from person to person depending on the reasons that people have for taking the drug. A good example of this is Prozac. All right, Prozac is used to treat anxiety, OCD, depression, etc. In these cases, the main effect for these people is a reduction in anxiety. But Prozac also has the effect of reducing a person's sex drive, right? So reducing libido. So some people may need Prozac to control their sex drive, to reduce their sex drive. For the people who want a reduction in horniness, the lowered sex drive would be the main effect, and then any reduction in anxiety would be a side effect. It all depends on why you're using Prozac. Again, just main idea here, the main effects are the reason for taking the drug, the side effects are the effects of taking the drug that are unwanted. And then toxicity refers to how poisonous or harmful a substance can be. In the context of pharmacology, drug toxicity occurs when a person has accumulated too much of a drug in their bloodstream, leading to adverse effects on the body. Toxicity, it's just as bad as it sounds. Now, when it comes to therapy, we gotta talk about pharmacotherapy. Pharmacotherapy is the use of drugs for beneficial purposes to improve somebody's function. Most drugs do have a therapeutic benefit. If you're looking at a class of drugs that are used to treat conditions, one thing you should do is look at how effective they are at treating stuff, like, for example, treating pain. A good example of this is heroin, because heroin can treat intractable pain, or pain that will not go away. Therefore, there is a role for opioids when it comes to the treatment of pain, but there is a fine line between opioids being useful and opioids being dangerous, because opioids are very addictive. This all leads us to drug history. All right, we're gonna talk about substances from nature and substances from the lab. Starting off with natural opioids. Opioids come from poppy. Poppy is a naturally occurring plant. Within the poppy plant, there are two opioids, morphine and codeine. So the two natural opioids are morphine and codeine, or codine, or codeine, depending on how you say it. Morphine and codeine are both naturally occurring, but they are also both dangerous. Morphine was isolated in 1803 by some German chemist whose name I cannot pronounce, Morphine is great at reducing pain, but it is also highly addictive. And to this point, we have an example of people after the Civil War. People after the Civil War treated with morphine became addicted to the stuff because yes, morphine, despite being natural, is highly addictive. Similar story for codeine. It was isolated by accident in the 1830s by some French chemist whose name I can't pronounce. And again, despite it being natural, codeine, much like morphine, is very addictive. So those are the natural opioids. We also have to consider semi-synthetic opioids, all right? These are things that are kinda sorta natural, kinda sorta not. Heroin is semi-synthetic because it is made from morphine, okay? So heroin was first made from morphine in 1898. Basically what happened was a bunch of chemists at Bayer and Co. wanted to modify morphine into something that wasn't so addictive. They created heroin, and heroin was then marketed as being not so addictive, but of course that was false advertising. So even though heroin does not occur naturally, it is still built off of naturally occurring morphine. So you've taken something natural and you've built it into something semi-synthetic. So morphine and codeine are the natural opioids. They come from poppy. 
And then the semi-synthetic opioid is heroin because it is built off of morphine. With those out of the way, we get on to the synthetic opioids. All right, here we're talking about stuff that is entirely made in the lab. Oxycodone is entirely synthetic, and it is super addictive. Fentanyl, methadone, and buprenorphine are all synthetics. These are opioids that were all made entirely in a lab with the aim to reduce pain. Fentanyl is so potent that you don't need a lot of it to produce the effects. All right, a small amount will go a very long way which is why fentanyl most easily causes overdose deaths. In fact, fentanyl mixed with other drugs for an added kick is what oftentimes causes ODs. But these other ones here, methadone and buprenorphine, they're a little less scary. All right, methadone has been used therapeutically for some time as a treatment. And buprenorphine has also been used in the treatment of opioid addiction because it is generally less addictive. We'll talk more about these later, just keep them in mind for now. All right, one last thing to note before moving on, we're gonna talk about drugs today, all right? The current use levels of opioids have risen since COVID. We are in an epidemic of opioid use, abuse, and overdose deaths. This is a serious epidemic in the United States. The two most concerning drugs are opioids and methamphetamine. Okay, let's talk about pharmacokinetics. Remember, pharmacokinetics, kinetic, movement, we're talking about the movement of drugs through the body. So, a drug's journey. Drugs, as we know, are exogenous, all right? They originate outside of the body. So, to have an effect on us, these drugs must enter our body and move to a site of action. Then, after they've reached their site and had their effect, they have to be inactivated and moved out of the body. Drugs move from the outside environment into the body, then they travel through the body to the site of action, and then finally, they leave the body. The reason that psychologists care about pharmacokinetics is because knowing how a drug moves through the body and how it moves out of the body provides a way to treat overdose. Understanding pharmacokinetics with opioids has helped us learn ways to treat overdoses and effectively prevent overdose deaths. The general rule here is that if a drug has any addictive potential at all, if it is in a form that allows it to move quickly through the body, then the fast-moving form of the drug will be more addictive because it will move faster from the outside environment to the site of action. Speed is correlated with the addictive potential of a drug. A good example of this is cocaine. All right, cocaine from the coca leaf consumed in its raw form is absorbed and eliminated very slowly. And so this coca leaf form has much less addictive potential. But if you snort purified cocaine, then this will be absorbed much faster. And that is why purified cocaine is much more addictive. The speed at which a drug is absorbed and reaches the site will affect its addictive potential. The rule of thumb here is that speed is key. Oral routes of administration take more time to absorb because the substance goes to the stomach, then into the blood, and then travels back up to the brain. So, oral route is generally the slowest. Since we know that speed is key, a factor that contributes to speed is the site of administration. The site of administration makes a difference by affecting how quickly the drug gets into the bloodstream and how quickly the drug exits. A drug may have to move across many biological barriers to get into the bloodstream, depending on how it is administered. But once a drug does get into the blood, it is in the major route in the body. So think about how many biological barriers there are between the outside world and your bloodstream. That's all the stuff that a drug has to pass through in order to enter the major route in the body. For this reason, inhalation and injection are the two rapid routes of administration that carry the highest risk for abuse. Inhalation has the highest abuse potential because yes, opioids can be smoked and thus they can be readily abused. Injection then, IV, is the second frequently abused rapid means of administration because the needle gets the drug right into the bloodstream, right into the major route of the body. This way, the drug does not have to get through any biological barriers. You are depositing the drug right into the bloodstream and then it's going to travel like it does. That leads us to drugs in the blood, all right? Once a drug is in the bloodstream, it is in the major transport system. It takes only a few seconds for the drug to distribute across the whole body. Diffusion is what tends to move the drug across the different biological barriers, moving the drug from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That is diffusion. Diffusion is an important mechanism for moving the drug through the body. But the effects of the drug are not occurring in the bloodstream, no. 
the drugs are effective at their sites of action in the brain. So remember, drugs are effective at their sites of action in the brain, not the bloodstream. The blood is just what carries the drug to the brain. So the drug enters the blood, it gets distributed through the blood supply, and then travels out of the blood to the sites of action in the brain. The primary sites of action are in the nervous system, in the brain, typically at the synapses. This is the journey that drugs have to make in order to have any effect. And to this point, there's a little bit to talk about when it comes to heroin, morphine, and fentanyl. Heroin is just a more rapid form of morphine. Remember, heroin is semi-synthetic. It is built off of naturally occurring morphine. Heroin can move across biological barriers much quicker once heroin gets into the blood. It can quickly move out of the blood and into the synapses of the brain. So basically, heroin is just a form of morphine that is much quicker. Morphine, on the other hand, is slower. Once heroin enters the brain, it is converted into morphine. So really, heroin is just a more efficient way of delivering morphine to the brain. And then when it comes to fentanyl, this stuff is very rapidly put into the blood, and it can very rapidly leave the blood. Fentanyl gets to the site of action faster than anything else, and it has a very strong effect. So once the drugs have entered the blood, dispersed through the bloodstream, made their way to the brain, and had their fun, it's time for them to leave. All right, inactivation is what we're talking about now. Inactivation changes the drug so that it is not physically able to move through the body. There are two primary ways that drugs are inactivated, metabolism and elimination. Without the processes of inactivation, the drug would just keep circling through the blood, and we can't be having that. So metabolism and elimination. Let's start with metabolism. When it comes to metabolism, the body will break down the drug molecule so that it will be unable to interact with the site of action, and thus the drug molecule will stop having its effect. Metabolism makes it so that the drug cannot diffuse anymore, because remember, diffusion is what got this thing started, moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. We do not have specific enzymes for specific drugs. The enzymes involved in the metabolism of drugs are very general, so that one single enzyme may have an effect on multiple drugs. The important thing here is that enzymes are generated in the liver. So metabolism of drugs primarily happens in the liver, but these enzymes are still effective throughout the body. As an aside, these enzymes are usually referred to as P450s. What these enzymes do is they metabolize opioids, all right? They break down opioids into an inactive molecule that is then passed out of the body. To metabolize a drug, it may take the body well, variable amounts of time, depending on the drug. And here we talk about half-life, okay? Half-life is the amount of time that it takes for half of the drug to be rendered inactive. Half-life is a time frame in which half of the drug has been metabolized. Different drugs have different half-lives. Morphine's half-life, for example, is three to four hours. All right, morphine is mostly metabolized within 18 to 24 hours. The reason we care about half-lives is because anybody who prescribes drugs needs to know what the half-life of that drug is so that they can track how long the drug will stay in the person's system. Also, when a drug is entirely eliminated from the body, a person will go through withdrawal as the drug produces withdrawal effects. This is important to psychologists who work with clients dealing with drug problems. By knowing the half-life of a drug, you can anticipate how long it will stay in the person's system, how much time is left until it is inactivated. So that was all metabolism. Now we get into elimination. So elimination is physically moving the drug out of the body. Metabolism is what made the drug inactive. Now elimination is what kicks it out of the body. The primary route of elimination for opioids is through the urine, all right? We're talking about kidneys here. You mostly piss out these opioids because elimination occurs through the kidneys. Metabolism Half-Life asks the question, how long does it take to metabolize half of the drug? But then Elimination Half-Life asks the question, how long does it take to eliminate half of the drug? So when it comes to metabolism, we're talking about breaking down the drug and when it comes to elimination, we are talking about kicking the drug out of the body. The important thing to note here also is that metabolism happens in the liver, whereas elimination happens in the kidney, all right? So metabolism, these enzymes originating from the liver, are what render the drugs inactive, 
which is why a person with compromised liver function will have difficulty metabolizing drugs. So anybody who regularly abuses alcohol, who has compromised liver function, will have a very difficult time breaking down drugs in their system. And then when it comes to elimination, we see that elimination, again, you mostly piss these opioids out. Where does piss come from? Urine, urine in the kidneys, all right? So a person with compromised kidney function will have difficulty eliminating drugs. A person with kidney function compromised would be like a diabetic, right? So anybody who's diabetic will have a difficult time eliminating drugs from their system. A uh, little note here before we move on, if you get a question asking like what is the primary way that drugs are eliminated from the body, the answer is urine. It's urination. All right, so that was all pharmacokinetics, movement of drug through the body. Now we get into pharmacodynamics, the action of the drug on the body. Drugs and behavior. All right, here we determine the specific receptor type that opioids bind to. Drugs alter our behavior because they interact with our nervous system in very specific ways, usually by interacting with specific neurotransmitters that are ready to receive the drug. Drugs have specific sites of action, all right? There are sites of action ready to receive these drugs. Drugs bind to the receptors and create effects at that level. We gotta know where in the nervous system the drugs are having their effect. And here we talk about opioid receptors. All right, these were first discovered in 1973. Most sites of action are the receptors of neurotransmitters in the brain. There are multiple types of opioid receptors. The receptors in our brain are there to receive the naturally occurring opioids in our brain. So the receptor sites in our brain that receive these opioids are designed for endogenous opioids, but because we are putting exogenous opioids into our system, well, these sites are receiving them instead. By knowing the site of action and what happens at that site of action, we have the opportunity to either block or enhance those sites of action. Typically, treatment of these drugs involves blocking their effects. This is why it is important to know the sites of action for treatment. Again, the important thing to note here is that opioids interact with certain types of receptors that are designed for endogenous opioids. The one that has to do with the Psychological effects, right, the reduction in pain and the cause of addiction, is the Mu receptor. When the Mu receptor is activated, it will inhibit the nerve cell. So imagine you have a nerve cell, and on this nerve cell is a Mu receptor, all right, and when that Mu receptor is activated, the function of that nerve cell is inhibited. So when Mu gets activated, when Mu turns on, the function of that nerve cell is inhibited. The primary effects will be at voltage-sensitive calcium ion channels and potassium ion channels. When Mu receptors are activated by drugs like morphine, they will cause potassium to flow out of the cell and they will reduce the activity of voltage-sensitive calcium ion channels. The reason for this is because when opioids interact with the Mu receptor, whichever nerve cells have that Mu receptor on them will be inhibited. And to this point, I say Mu receptors are metabotropic, all right? Metabotropic. When Mu receptors are activated, the ion channels are not part of the receptor itself. Therefore, Mu receptors are not ionotropic, they are metabotropic. I think that's important. All right, two important things are gonna happen when the Mu receptors get activated. For one, potassium is going to flow out of the cell. We see an increase in the opening of potassium channels so that potassium flows out of the cell. If someone consumes an opioid, that drug will bind to the Mu receptor and activate it. Now, once active, Mu will force potassium to leave the nerve cell. The nerve cell interior then becomes more negative and is therefore less likely to reach threshold. In other words, it is less likely to reach action potential. Mu is activated by an opioid. When Mu is activated, potassium will flow out of the cell. We therefore lose positive charge and the cell becomes more negative in the interior. This reduces the likelihood of any action potential being generated. Making the charge more negative takes us further away from the threshold required to trigger an action potential. So you can imagine that here is threshold, all right, and as potassium is leaving the cell, we are getting further and further and further away from any chance of actually reaching threshold 
and reaching action potential. The other thing that happens when Mu is activated is that calcium ion channels will remain closed even if action potential arrives. If someone consumes an opioid, there will be a reduction in the activity of voltage-sensitive calcium ion channels. These are critical for exocytosis, or the release of neurotransmitters. Mu will reduce these calcium ion channels and thus cause the nerve cell to have less of an effect on the next nerve cell. Exocytosis will become hampered across all connected nerve cells. This is how nerve cell activity is produced. Once you slow down one nerve cell, you slow down every nerve cell in its web. Now, normally when action potential occurs at the axon terminal, the calcium ion channels will sense this, open up, and let calcium flow into the cell. Vesicles would then be released from their docks, flow to the edge of the cell, and release neurotransmitters into the synapse. But when Mu is activated, it closes those voltage-sensitive calcium ion channels so that even if action potential arrives, nothing is going to happen. This is how Mu receptors inhibit the activity of nerve cells. When an opioid activates a Mu receptor on that nerve cell, the Potassium will flow out of the cell, and we will see a reduction in the activity of voltage-sensitive calcium ion channels, which will ultimately result in the nerve cell being inhibited. So even if action potential arrives, nothing's going to happen. So with all that out of the way, all right, that's a total explanation of how mu receptors work, right? So what happens when mu receptor is activated? Well, the nerve cell gets inhibited. Now we talk about three things. We're going to talk about overdose deaths, we're going to talk about addiction, and we're going to talk about the therapeutic effects or the analgesic effects. Rolling back to where action occurs. The medulla is key to understanding the lethality of overdoses, okay? We're talking about overdose deaths. Wherever the nerve cells are located, they are being inhibited when Mu is activated. The medulla has a large number of Mu receptors, so if someone consumes an opioid, then the functions of the medulla will be inhibited. The functions of the medulla include breathing, heart rate, and other basic survival stuff. So the medulla, that part of the brain responsible for keeping you alive, with all of its mu receptors now activated by the opioid that you've consumed, medulla becomes inactivated, it becomes hampered, all right? The functions of the medulla slow down, and because of that, well, overdose death. This is why you have to be mindful of how high the dosage of the drug is. Otherwise, you may slow your functions and die. Addiction, all right, talking about where action occurs. People are addicted to drugs because of the presence of Mu receptors on interneurons. Now, this may seem weird at first, but when someone consumes an opioid, the activity in the pleasure pathway will actually increase, right? The person will experience more pleasure. The pleasure pathway is key to addiction. After a person consumes an opioid, they will get a spike in pleasure. This may seem odd because Mu is supposed to inhibit nerve cells, but the key here is where the Mu receptors are located. All right, the Mu receptors are not located on the ventral tegmental area, nor is Mu located on the nucleus accumbens. No, Mu receptors are actually located on a different set of nerve cells that affect the pleasure pathway. Opioids interact with interneurons that are near the VTA nerve cells. The Mu receptors are on the interneurons. The interneurons are inhibitory on the VTA nerve cells, which is why when the interneurons are inhibited, the VTA nerve cells are able to party. Interneurons are an inhibitor. The interneurons inhibit the VTA function, which is why when the inhibitor gets inhibited, the VTA is able to party and you experience pleasure. A good way to think of this is when the interneurons are active, the VTA nerve cells are on a leash, all right? But when the interneurons are inhibited by the activation of a Mu receptor, the VTA nerve cells are let off of their leash, and so we experience pleasure. When you take an opioid, you inhibit the inhibitor, all right? You inhibit the interneurons, and so you let the VTA nerve cells run wild. Best way to visualize this, all right. All right, here's how you can visualize this, all right? So here we have an interneuron, okay? The interneuron is inhibiting the VTA cells. It's not letting you experience an abundance of pleasure, all right? It has your pleasure on a leash. So now what we see happen with this interneuron has these Mu receptors, okay? The Mu receptors are not on 
the VTA. No, the Mu receptors are on the interneurons. So what happens is you take an opioid and the opioid goes to the Mu receptor and it inhibits the interneuron. When you take an opioid and the opioid activates the Mu receptor on the interneuron, the interneuron becomes inhibited. And with that interneuron inhibited, suddenly the VTA is able to run wild. That is why you experience an abundance of pleasure, is because your interneurons have been inhibited by the activation of Mu receptors. And so over here, your VTA nerve cells, your pleasure pathway runs wild. That's why you become addicted to the stuff. VTA nerve cells. There they are. Now, to this point, some drugs may block the effects of addictive drugs. If you block the boost of pleasure, you reduce the addictive effects. This is how you can block the effects of addictive drugs, but in doing so, you block the person's ability to feel any pleasure at all. Simplest way to think about this is drugs wouldn't be addictive if they didn't feel good, which is why there are other drugs that we can use to block that feel-good effect of the addictive drugs, making them not as addictive. But again, if you just block the person's pleasure outright, then you reduce their ability to feel any pleasure at all. The reason I'm talking about this here is because remember, when it comes to addiction, the location of opioids affects the pleasure pathway indirectly, right? We're talking about opioids that attach to the mu receptors on the interneurons affecting the pleasure pathway indirectly, which is why we can block the effects of opioids without shutting down all pleasure. By adjusting the interneurons to block the effects of opioids, the person can still enjoy pleasure. We haven't totally snuffed out their pleasure pathway, we've just adjusted those interneurons to make the addictive drugs less addictive. All right, before we talk more on addiction, I wanna talk about a therapeutic effects and analgesic effects. All right, here we talk about where action occurs. Analgesic effects, we're talking about the inability to feel pain. All right, drugs can be therapeutic because of the mu receptors in the dorsal root of the spinal cord. Spinal cord has a part called the dorsal root and the nerve cells near the dorsal root are the pain pathway. These nerve cells have a high concentration of mu receptors. So these nerve cells actively transmit pain signals to the brain. The dorsal root pain pathway is constantly ready to tell you that you're in pain. They send a signal, you feel pain. But remember, because they have a high concentration of mu receptors, you take an opioid, opioid, activates the mu receptors, and then the mu receptors inhibit the function of that nerve cell, all right, inhibit the pain pathway, so you get a relief from pain. So analgesic effects, inability to feel pain, it happens because of the mu receptors in the dorsal root of the spinal cord. When the mu receptors activate and inhibit the nerve cells within the dorsal root, the person will feel a relief from pain. Very powerful relief. You can figure out a drug's effect on pain by figuring out where that drug works in the body and what that area does to pain. All right, only two more things to talk about. We're going to talk about addiction and then we're going to talk about treatment. So let's start with addiction, also known as use disorder, according to the DSM-5. Let's define addiction. According to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, addiction is a chronic, relapsing brain disease that is characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use despite harmful consequences. Now this definition of addiction is great because it emphasizes brain disease. There is a physical reality here and that is an incredibly important point. It is important that we recognize that addiction is a brain disease. Addiction is a real physical illness that is removed from ideas of willpower or drive. The definition also has a point here about it being chronic, okay? So we're talking about something that is persistent. The disease is chronic. If someone goes through treatment, you have to monitor them for upwards of five years in order to determine if treatment was actually effective. Relapsing is another important point because most relapses occur after people go through the withdrawal phase. In the past, we thought that people relapsed because they could not stand the withdrawal symptoms, but this is only actually true in some cases. People will often go through withdrawal but then relapse. The withdrawal symptoms then cannot be the thing driving them back to the drug. We think that the relapse is telling us about the 
psychological aspect, which is the term that we threw out in favor of craving. The relapse occurs because people are re-exposed to cues of the drug that then trigger a craving. So the reason people relapse is not because of withdrawal symptoms, but instead because of craving. Also, it's important to note that relapse can occur under both positive and negative emotions. People may relapse when they lose their job, or people may relapse when they get a promotion. We also point out that drug use is very compulsive. It is mindless. It is habitual. The person will engage in stereotypic behavior to attain the drug, much like the compulsivity of someone with OCD. And finally, we talk about harmful consequences. Everything that we've talked about, everything that has to do with the drug, all occurs despite harmful consequences. Now, when it comes to harmful consequences in this context, we are mainly talking about harmful consequences on the body. Trouble may occur with the legal system, sure, but those aren't the harmful consequences that we're talking about. In fact, we've actually gotten away from reference to law with this definition. Now let's talk about the neural basis of addiction. The core part of addiction starts with the pleasure pathway. The pleasure path is the path between the ventral tegmental area, VTA, and the nucleus accumbens. By activating the pleasure pathway, the brain undergoes the changes that are associated with addiction. Opioids are addictive because they stimulate the ventral tegmental area nucleus accumbens circuit. Once addiction is underway, the pleasure pathway tends to become quite tolerant of the drug, so the person has to consume more and more of the drug to produce the pleasure that they seek. So, in the beginning, their tolerance is down here, so it doesn't take much of the drug for them to meet the desired effects. But as their tolerance grows and grows and grows, they need more and more and more of the drug in order to reach their desired effects. Sections of the brain key to addiction include the hippocampus, the amygdala, the striatum, and also there's a little bit here on the cerebellum and the prefrontal cortex. Starting with the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the part of the brain that is important for memory. So, because of the hippocampus, you will readily form and retrieve memories of the drug. It is because of the hippocampus that you are constantly reminded of the drug. Then we have the amygdala. All right, the amygdala is important for emotion. So you have an emotional attachment to the drug. People may describe their drug of choice like they would a best friend. And that is because of the amygdala. So the hippocampus is memory, the amygdala is emotion. And then we have the striatum also known as the basal ganglia. This is important for forming habits. We're talking about mindless, well-ingrained motor movements. This gives you an impulsive response to the cues of the drug. So when it comes to the habits around a person's drug use, that is because of the striatum, or you know, also known as the basal ganglia. The drug may also have lots of cues that trigger a craving, and this is because of the cerebellum. The cerebellum is key to classical conditioning, and that is why there are many cues that trigger a craving. Addicts spend a lot of time thinking about how to acquire the drug, and this is because their prefrontal cortex has been tampered by the drug. But those parts of the brain, the cerebellum and the prefrontal cortex, they're not as important really as the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the striatum. The brain becomes hijacked by the drug. The hippocampus, the amygdala, and the basal ganglia become more sensitive to cues of the drug that trigger cravings. These cravings are key to understanding addiction. So again, real quick, running down the list, hippocampus, memory. Amygdala, emotion. Striatum, also known as basal ganglia, habits. Those are the roles that they play when it comes to drug addiction. Okay, tolerance and dependence. All right, if people consume opioids regularly, they will develop a rapid level of tolerance. Tolerance is this idea that I need more to produce the same desired effect. Tolerance is at the level of the receptor. Receptors overwhelmed by opioid molecules will become desensitized to them. Tolerance develops fastest to euphoric and analgesic effects, so anything that makes you feel good and anything that relieves your pain. As tolerance develops, the brain is still very vulnerable to the damaging effects of the drug. There is no tolerance to the bad effects. This pushes people closer to the lethal dose. With continued use, you will see a higher likelihood of overdose deaths. Tolerance does not develop to lethal effects. So, as a person takes more drugs, they get pushed closer and closer to overdosing. Here's a good way to explain this. All right, so imagine, if you will, that here 
are the desired effects. All right, at this moment, you are not very tolerant of the drug, so it doesn't take much to reach the desired effects. Boop. As your tolerance increases, you need more of the drug to reach the desired effects. All right, so you start putting more drugs in your system. And as you do, the desired effects keep getting harder and harder to reach as your tolerance develops. So you need more and more and more of the drug. And eventually, in order to reach these desired effects, you will have to put so much of the drug in your body that you reach the lethal dose because you do not develop tolerance to the lethality of the drug. And when you reach this point, you overdose and you die. Now, tolerance develops at different rates for different effects of the drug. An example to illustrate this, the medulla has mu receptors that opioids will interact with. This can produce lethal effects if you take a high enough dose. Of course, the doses vary, but when you hit the lethal dose, you will die. Fentanyl is lethal at 2 milligrams, heroin is lethal at 100 milligrams, and morphine is lethal at 500 milligrams. On the streets, the introduction of fentanyl has contributed to more overdose deaths because it is lethal at such a low amount, especially when it is added to other drugs. All right, finally, we talk about treatment. Pharmacological treatment of the morphine heroin hook. Understanding the site of action is what allows us to block the opioid's action at that site. Blocking the site of action can save someone's life. It is very beneficial. There are binding sites on mu receptors. When you block these binding sites, you block the effects of the drug. So if you want to block an overdose, simply block the receptor site for the opioid. So the opioid in your system will bind to the mu receptors to inhibit the function of whatever nerve cell those mu receptors are on. When the effect of the opioid is blocked, it is as if there is no drug in the person's system at all. Now let's talk about naloxone, okay? Naloxone is a mu receptor antagonist. The substance, okay, the antagonist, will bind to the site of action on the mu receptor, but there is no effect produced. The naloxone simply shields the mu receptor from the effects of other substances. In this way, the antagonist is basically a blocker. The antagonist sits on the receptor site so that other drugs can no longer affect that receptor. Naloxone has a short window of effect, okay, right around 30 minutes, but this is enough time to save somebody from an overdose. This right here, this is the stuff I'm talking about. Naloxone is marketed as Narcan. It is a mu receptor antagonist. It just sits on the mu receptor and it blocks other substances from having any effect. That's how it saves lives. Talking about the goal of treatment, all right? You can treat addictions in the brain if you accept that addiction is a brain disease. If you know the action of the opioids at the level of the receptor, you can deal with the addiction itself. There are a few strategies to help people function, but the goal is not abstinence, although it was in the past. Nowadays, we acknowledge that relapses do happen. So instead, the goal of treatment is to improve the person's function so that they can live a quality life because yes, relapses do happen, which is why the goal is to relapse less, function better. The goal is not abstinence, it's just improved function. Now, like I said, there are a few strategies. One of them is no pain, no gain. The other is medication. So let's talk about no pain, no gain. One strategy is to just block the mu receptors, okay? When you do this, the person feels no pleasure. It is like there are no opioids in the person's system. They will withdraw and it will be very unpleasant. Blocking receptors triggers withdrawal. Using naloxone or other drugs will actually block the pleasure pathway entirely and deny the person pleasure altogether. This is the idea of pharmacological Calvinism. If a person taking drugs wants to get off of drugs, then they will take other drugs to help them get off of the addictive drugs, and in doing so, they will forego all pleasure and suffer the effects of doing so. But of course, since people don't like going through life without pleasure, blocking the mu receptors entirely is not a good idea. Blocking the receptor is good for immediately saving a person's life. That's the Narcan. But blocking the receptor entirely is not good for long-term treatment. That's why we have the second strategy, medications. All right, medications for treatment. This is where I bring back the synthetic stuff 
Remember all that time ago, way back up here, when I told you to keep these in mind? Methadone and buprenorphine? Yeah, that's right. They're back. Here they are. The best medications for opioid addiction treatment are methadone and buprenorphine. Methadone is the standard medication treatment for addiction. Methadone is an opioid. It is a mu receptor agonist, okay? It acts at the receptor sites just like other opioids, but methadone is a weaker agonist than heroin or morphine. What methadone does is it induces pleasure and reduces pain, but typically its actions are weak enough to not be lethal. Methadone is quite safe, and it stays in the body for a longer period of time than other opioids. It stays bound to the receptors so it produces greater tolerance. With methadone, it is harder to produce an overdose, which makes it safer to use, and it stays in the body longer, which produces greater tolerance. In this way, methadone reduces the effects of other opioids. The treatment for opioids in this way is basically opioids. That's the essence of methadone. And then we have buprenorphine. Okay, buprenorphine is a mu receptor inverse agonist partial agonist or a mixed agonist. All right, it's got a few different names. The important thing about it is that buprenorphine interacts with the mu receptor and partly activates the receptor while also partly acting like an antagonist. Remember, antagonists, what they do is they sit on the receptor and they shield anything from activating it. What an agonist does is it activates the receptor. So buprenorphine does a little bit of both. Buprenorphine will sit on the receptor, it will partially activate it, but it will also partially block other substances from getting in. Buprenorphine competes with other opioids very well while staying in the person's system. Buprenorphine binds to the mu receptors and it creates a mild effect while blocking other opioids off of the mu receptor site. Buprenorphine still produces the agonist effect, so the person gets pleasure, but it's in a weaker form. The buprenorphine, as an agonist, stimulates the mu receptor while also acting like an antagonist that blocks the effects of other opioids. Because of this mixed agonist property, buprenorphine can outcompete other opioids even though its effects on the receptor are weaker and therefore safer, much lower risk of overdose death. Now, whether you use methadone or buprenorphine as medications for treatment, it would be ideal of you to take these pharmacological treatments and combine them with behavioral treatments. That is how you would get the best results possible. All right, I think that is going to do it. That is everything for chapter five. We've talked about drug history. We've talked about pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. We've talked about addiction, and we've talked about treatment. So with everything now covered, that is going to do it. Thank you all for watching.